did pay the light bill. Um, just, uh, just want to announce that you know we have we have about ten or twelve, ten or eleven new people here today. So wow, if you're new here, on the back of your bulletin, there's a little place in there for your information. If you'll fill that out and put it in our tithe and offering box, we'll be glad to get you hooked up with our email. And if you didn't get a uh, a new, little new person, new people's package, come back next Sunday. Miss Chrissy, right there, she said she apologized. She only had ten packages, and they all went out. So. Uh, so come back next week. Uh, Wednesday, the 27th, we're going to be having communion. And let me, let me tell you, if you, you, know, you don't come out for potluck, we have a great time here for potluck. We, everybody comes out and brings a dish, and we get to fellowship. Man, we have a great time. This, just like Saturday, this past Saturday, we had about 26 men come from our, for our men's breakfast. And we just had breakfast, and we fellowshiped, and, and we just... You know, we just grow together, and that's what we do here on Wednesday Wednesday uh, night potlucks. We, uh, the women are doing a Bible study, Taming the Tongue. If you're interested in that, you can hook up with Miss Chrissy back there. She's wandering off on me. And then Tuesday morning, we are starting a new Bible, uh, a new, uh, Bible study on Titus. It's right here at 8.30 in the mornings, and then we do it at 6. Jim does it at 6.30 in the afternoons. Does a great job with it. We're getting ready. Uh, we're still packing up bags for uh, the Day of the Child there in Mexico. Uh, we're excited about that. And uh, me and Jeff Clark have, uh, I know that we had just come off of Cairo's weekend, and we do a lot of prison ministries, and y'all hear us a lot talk about going into prison and, and, and how God's just working in mighty ways inside the prison. Me and Jeff Clark, they're doing a new Cairo's about two hours from here. And... Uh, about two months ago, one of the leaders asked me to, to go in and, and be a part of that team. Jeff Clark jumped on it. He's going to be a part of it. We need some financial help. That's why we have our table set up back there. And we're just selling meal tickets again like we always do. And then we got prayer chains back there like we always do. We need to keep spreading the gospel as much as possible. And these people inside of prison are hungry. They're hungry for God's word. And we just ask that y'all step with us, partner with us. We also ask that you partner with us here at Calvary Chapel Waco. If you call this your home church, if this is where you think you belong, then you need to partner with us. We, we just need you to partner with us so we can continue to reach out and do some of the things we do. We're just grateful and we're thankful to God that he has given us a pastor like Pastor Albert that comes in here and, and tells us the truth that doesn't hold nothing back. He lets it have it just like the Bible tells, gives it to us. We should be thankful for him. Thankful that God has allowed him to be our minister. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that you do. We just ask that you open the hearts and minds of your children that are here today, Father God, and that you continue, continue to anoint Pastor Albert and let him bring forth the word that we can understand and let us be doers of the word, Father God, not just hearers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand and let's just get ready to praise. Father, that right now we're waiting for you, Father. Sometimes in our lives it feels like he's just so far from us. We feel that we're so far. But all that we need to do is just wait for him. We just need to praise him, just read his word, and just lift up his name. Because only he knows what's best for us. Only he knows what's going on in our minds and in our hearts. And I pray that this morning that every person in this room, that just with anybody that's going through anything personal or spiritually, Father, I pray that you just take over their lives right now. And let's just have this time to just worship and lift up his name because he's worthy of our praise. He's just so worthy. Faith can move the mountains, let the mountains move. We come with expectation, waiting here for you.
Guys, let's clap our hands as we get ready to pray. You 
stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the ocean drains, I don't have to be afraid. Because I know that you love me. Your love never fails. Oh, oh, oh. Your love never fails. Oh, oh, oh. Your love never fails. She stayed the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid because I know that you love me. It's your love never.
church to sing the chorus. just pray to him. God, that we just thank you for how amazing you are. We just thank you for your presence, your beautiful presence that you allow us to just experience, God. God, that in the storm, Father, in the deep of the storm, God, that we raise a hallelujah to you. Father, that darkness flees when we plead, when we, uh, plead the blood of Jesus over you. Well, over us, sorry. God, that you're so amazing. All right, let's give him a round of applause because he's good. And you may be seated. Amen. 
I, uh, I want to mention real quick what we've been doing the last few weeks uh, with the 40 Days for Life. Um, we're still going out there. Um, people are going at different times. Um, I've been going out there on Thursday mornings uh, from 7 to about 8.45 or so, and you can go anytime during the day. The sun comes a little bit later in the day. Um, but we've had probably 25, 30 people in, in the course of a couple of weeks from our church going out there. Um, and, you know, we're not protesting per se. We're just standing in the gap and praying. We're just standing in, there in the gap and just praying over the clinic, praying for those young women that are finding themselves in a position to feel the need to go and terminate the pregnancy of the child that they found themselves pregnant with. And we're not there to judge them. We're not there to rain guilt on them or anything like that. We're just praying for life. Um, as you can see, you know, when, when, when somebody turns around and, and decides not to follow through and they see these people out there praying, a lot of times they'll stop and ask for prayer. And, and so you can kind of get a, a number of some of the ones that are um, um, coming out of that who who chosen to, um, to have the baby. Um, we have a couple of pictures. Our church seems to be, of all the churches in Waco, getting the most people out there. Um, serving and praying, and, and um, so it's, it's, it's good that we have a church that wants to be a church of action, uh, be, the, be the hands and feet of Jesus, and so anyways, these are what, they're, what they ask for, you know, that we can be praying and giving and helping and just supporting, so you can go to the website and uh, find out more more when you can go out there. If you can go out there for just one hour, that'd be great. Um, but anyways, that, that's important to us uh, in what we're doing. And then the movie's coming out, Unplanned. Um, it'll be coming out. I think it's just a one... Oh, it's showings every day. Okay, so be paying attention for that if you get a chance to go see it, and hopefully it'll move you to, to more action and more prayer. Um, so anyways, now my daughter was in Dominican Republic last week, and um, she didn't want to do this, but I told her she had to come and, um, and say something about her trip. Come on up, Hannah. Isn't she the most beautiful thing ever? <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the trip, Mom. Stand up here. <laughs> Just tell us a little bit about the trip, kind of what, what God showed you, what you experienced, how it was, and... Um, so we built a house for a family that didn't have a house, and so it ended up taking us only three days to build it. It was supposed to take us four, um, but when we got there, it was just, like, so much fun. Like, even on the work site, like, building the whole thing, it was so much fun. Um, like, families, like, from down the road, like, they were over there helping us, and they all spoke Spanish. I didn't speak Spanish, and, like, they weren't getting, like, frustrated or impatient with us. Like, they were really patient. They were laughing at us. And um, even on the second day, the family offered to cook for 25 of us. And so it was just awesome seeing how, like, little they have, but yet, yet they were willing to cook for all of us. And there was a lot of food. And even, like, after we ate, they were like, come on, get some more, get seconds, get thirds. Like, they didn't think about taking it home for them and saving it for dinner or whatever. But... It was really awesome. It showed us humility for sure. Like, the place we were staying at, we had to take cold showers. So everybody hated it, but then, you know, you get there, and it's like they're grateful that they can even get a shower. But it was really awesome. That was pretty good, baby. <laughs> you did a good job. You did a good job. You did a good job. Yeah, I was proud of her for going. Um, we're going to do one more thing before we, before we move on. You know, one of the th exciting things about Passion of Church is uh, watching families come to church and then watch, watching families have kids and um, raise their kids with us and trust us as their church, as their church home, trust me as their pastor. And um, not only that, but want to follow through and, and make a public declaration that they want to dedicate their child to the Lord. Now, you know, a lot of us come from the Catholic backgrounds, and when we come from the Catholic background, you know, we, uh, we dedicate our kids as babies, and you sprinkle them, and, uh, you know, you, you dedicate them to the Lord or baptize them. 
you know, we in our church do it differently. What we do is we put the responsibility on the parents because that's whose responsibility it is anyways. It's the parents' responsibility. And so it's the parents actually making a vow. And if you know anything about vows, vows are not easily broken. A vow is something that you go to death with. There's no separation of a vow. A vow is a declaration before God and witnesses that you will do something and you will finish what you vowed to do and you will complete it. And uh, God took it very seriously. And so um, Ashley and Kyle, uh, I know I've seen Kyle. There he is. He's, he's your... So Fisher was dedicated a while back, right? We, we did Fisher's dedication um, several years ago. Um, y'all been coming to church almost 10 years now with us. And um, then we got little <laughs> Easton with us now. They look like brothers, don't they? Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, w- one of the things about being a parent is the responsibility of just meeting their physical needs, make sure they're clean fed, clothed, and that they have fun. But the biggest responsibility that we have is to, you know, raise them in the the way that the Lord would call us to raise them. And that's the hard part, especially in the world that we live in. And so there's a great responsibility on both your parts, not only your part, but all your family and friends as they support you in that as well. And so this is you just standing before the Lord saying, we will raise our children up in the ways of the Lord, regardless of what they do on their own. You do what you're supposed to do. Matter of fact, the Lord says that children are like an arrow in the quiver. And you pull those arrows out and it's your responsibility to see where you're going to shoot them at. Are you just going to fling them in the air or are you going to have a target in mind and let it go at a target? And that's kind of what we're asking of you today in this dedication. And um, so I'm going to represent the Lord for just a second. And um, you're going to hand him to me because when, when Hannah... Uh, not my Hannah, but Hannah in the Bible, Samuel's mother, when she cried out for a child, she told the Lord, if you give me a child, I will give him back to you. And so once she weaned him, she took him to the temple and she gave him to Eli to raise uh, in the way of the Lord. And he became a great, great prophet, great man of God. And um, I believe that, that we do the same things with our children. And so he's yours, but you're going to hand him to me. We're going to pray over him, and just like the Lord, I'm going to hand him back to you as your responsibility. Come here, buddy. Hey. (laughs) Who got you? Let's just pray and pray with me. Father, we just pray for the Lee family. We pray for Kyle and Ashley, Lord, and we thank you for their desire to raise their son up to follow after you. And, Lord, we pray that you give them wisdom and patience to raise their children, especially these two boys, Lord, for the rest of their lives. And I know, Lord God, that they will be good influences on their daughters as well as they grow up and as they see how adults are living, that they will recognize that their parents, Lord God, raised them right. And so, Father, we just thank you for the privilege of children, especially the privilege to teach them about you, Lord. And so, Father, I just thank you for this opportunity and pray for the, for, the, for the Lee family, Lord God, that you would give them every tool that they need so that they could provide for these children and show them who you are in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There you go, buddy. Go back and you got your little certificate. Thank you for letting me be a part of that. There's your toys back. <laughs> amen. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, the teaching today is going to be a little um, interesting because of the climate that we live in today, especially you Facebook posters, um, especially when it comes to politics. Now, there ain't nothing can make somebody more mad than politics. So today I'm going to help kind of balance you out and kind of help you find your place in this crazy political climate um, that we call the United States today. You know, right now we have a president who irritates everybody. We have a president that gets under everybody's skin. 
But I remember when the, the previous president, President Obama, was elected. We knew as Christians going in that he was pro, pro-homosexual, that he wasn't probably going to come in and lean towards the ideology of Christianity. Um, we know that when he came in, things started changing. We, we noticed that the bathroom rules began to change, that they opened up men's and women's restroom to whoever, whatever you desire to call yourself to go into those restrooms. And we as Christians, we kind of knew that that was coming. And I remember the day that before the election and we were praying that I told the church at that time, I go, look, whoever becomes president is God's man. Now, that's hard to hear because you would think when we say that's God's man that you would think that that would mean he's a godly man. You don't have to be a godly man to be God's man because Nebuchadnezzar was also God's man in the Old Testament. Darius was God's man in the Old Testament. And these were, uh, ki- these were kings who didn't really follow the Lord, didn't really know the Lord like the Jewish people knew the Lord. And so... Let, well, let's just read 1 Peter chapter 2 so you'll know exactly what I'm, what I'm getting at in case you haven't read it yet. 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to start in um, verse 13. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who were sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, Honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. Tough words to hear. For this is commendable if because of conscience towards God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. You should write that down or or underline that. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? That's one of them scriptures. You just go, what? For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called. Listen to what it just said. For to this you were called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Listen to what he's saying. He is saying that we are to submit to kings and rulers and governors and authorities above us. It didn't say if you lack their political affiliation. He did not say if you liked their um, policies. He said we were to submit to them. He said that we were to submit to them and respect them whether we like them or not. Because when this is written, Nero was the emperor. Nero was putting to death Christians. And he's telling them to submit to Nero who was putting Christians to death. To take it. To take the wrong, to take the suffering, to take it, and take it patiently. Now, that's not something Americans like to hear. 
Americans are proud and tough, and Americans don't stand for somebody pushing us around. We stand up for what's right. We have patriotism. We, we are patriots, and we have patriotism, which says you stand up to tyranny, which you stand up to that. That's not what Christianity has told us to do. Now, if somebody's coming and trying to slaughter us, what do we do? Do we just take the slaughter? I think you duck and dive. I think you duck and dive. Do you fire back? I know a lot of people in here are ready to fire back. But what do you do in a situation like that? Well, let's look to the Scriptures. Let's look to the Old Testament. Let's look and see what God says. Because here's the deal. You only have to endure the trouble of this life a very short time. You're only here for, in, 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 the, in the course of, of, of American history, we're only a small blip on that timeline. 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years maybe is nothing. It's nothing. But as Christians, we're called to a different place. We're called to perceive and to look at this world from a different perspective. We can't just look at it from a place of just being a patriot. We have to look at it from being a place of Christians, of Christianity. In Romans 13, when Paul wrote this years earlier, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. Now listen, Paul was executed under the very authority that he was saying we're to submit to. Peter was also martyred, executed under the authority of the government that ruled at that time that he's telling everybody to submit to. I'm just stating facts. True, biblical facts. For there is no authority. Listen to what it says. For there is no authority except from God. You're saying... That Kim Jong-un is put in place by God? That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Hitler, Adolf Hitler was put in place by God? That's what I'm saying. Stalin? Yes. Any, let me tell you something. I'm put here by God. I have, it, it, whether I corrupt this position, whether I corrupt it to the nth degree, I'm still put here by the Lord. Even if I mess it up, he'll take me out. He will move me out of the way. He will execute me and move me to the side when he's finished with me, if I need to be executed. God will move aside in his timing, but he also places people in position for different reasons, for judgment, for blessing. seems these days more for blessing judgment but it doesn't matter we're to submit to it therefore whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves so if the government tells me I have to do something that's immoral do I have to do it no no no, no. I'm gonna show you some examples here in a, in a minute for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. So what he's basically saying is just live your life so that the people around you are influenced by your good character. Not your bad words, not your opinions, not how you feel and how you think and how you're tearing stuff down, but how you honor God with your life just in your simple, simple life. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Oh, that's right. God told Christians to pay their taxes. He didn't say you couldn't use the system to pay as little taxes as possible. 
all the write-offs you can find, you use them. They're legally there for you to do, you use them. Don't pay any more than you have to. Trust me, I don't. <laughs> for because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing, rendered therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Even Jesus says, render under Caesar's what is Caesar's. In 1 Timothy, he says this, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God. So he said, pray for our leaders. Many of us are cussing our leaders. Many of them did that with the previous president, and I had to rebuke them too. We're not called to cuss out our leaders and our president, even if we don't like what they do. Because I can't tell you how many times I go, oh, man, I can see with these policies that, that, that maybe the Democrats are putting in, how it's going to squeeze the church, how it's going to put pressure on the church and try to make us conform to ideologies that are anti-biblical. If they say, you must marry homosexuals, that's going to put me in a very weird position. That's going to, have to, that's going to put me in a very unique position. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. In 1 Samuel 18, Saul is the king. He's the first king. Saul, who's the first king, is the anointed of God. David, who now is going to become the king behind Saul, is running for his life from Saul. Then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him, and he heard him singing, David, uh, Saul has slain his thousands, David has slain his ten thousands. So he became jealous. And it says this, then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him, and he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousand, and to me they have ascribed only a thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand as at other times. But there was a spear in Saul's hand and Saul cast the spear at David. For he said, I will pin him to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. He didn't try to retaliate. He didn't try to avenge what Saul was doing. He just ran, <laughs> which is what we can do if danger's coming at us. Then Saul said, the second time, a third time, thus you shall say to David, the king does not desire any dowry. So David is going to marry his daughter, Saul's daughter. And instead of paying money to, to, to marry the daughter, he was already supposed to get the daughter by killing Goliath. And then Saul added this extra dowry on it. And this is what he wants. He's going to try to set David up to be killed. So then he said, he don't want a dowry, but 100 foreskins of the Philistines to take vengeance on the enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. He thought by telling him to go get the 100 foreskins, from the Philistines that David would be killed by the Philistines. David came back with a thousand foreskins. David didn't play. 1 Samuel 24, now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines that it said to him, because now David's on the run. Now he's a fugitive. Take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goat. So he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave. Saul went in to attend his needs. And so David is hiding in these caves. And they're way back in the back of the recesses of the caves. And if you've ever been in a cave, looking into the cave, you can't see nothing. But the further you go back, you can look this way and you can see because the light's right there. So David and his men are quietly tucked into the back of the cave. Saul needs to use the restroom. Saul goes into this cave to use the restroom, 
And what do you think him and all the men are thinking? God just put him right there in our hands to take him out. God moved him right here for us to take him out. Then the men of David said to him, exactly what I would expect anybody to say to him. This is the day which the Lord has said to you. Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand that you may do to him as it seems good to you. That sounds scriptural. That sounds like from the voice of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord, that God would want to take vengeance on this man and everybody would believe it. But David was a man after God's own heart. And when you're a man after God's own heart, you don't walk in what you think is right. You walk in what God says is right. See, that's the difference between being your kind of Christian and being a true Christian. Because there, most of us can justify most anything and still feel like we're Christian. But a true Christian has to push through his own ideas and ideologies and feelings and push through and do what is right. And David arose secretly, cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. He felt bad for disrespecting Saul. And he said to his men, listen to what he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Whoever is our leaders, whoever are our leaders in this country, whether it's Republican, Democrat, liberal, socialist, whatever, we are to submit to their authority and trust God no matter what. They just can't make us do what God says we cannot do. We can, we can find separation between what we feel is right, what we think is right, and doing what God has told us to do what is right. And that is to reckon, no matter what somebody says right now, you as a Christian cannot say, not my president. You can't say that. You can say that, but you're not walking in biblical understanding to say that. No, even if Hillary was our president, or liberal, or, or, or socialist was our president, Elizabeth Warren, if she's our president, if, if this other little Spanish girl becomes our president, we may not like it, we may not like the policies, but we have to show the respect to the position as Christians. That's what David is teaching us. That's what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us as Christians, is to learn to respect the authorities there because God is in control. Don't worry, God will kill anybody he wants to take out. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. Another time. So David and Abashi came to the people by night, and there Saul, they, Saul's after him again, sleeping within the camp with the spear stuck in the ground by his head. And Abner and all the people lay all around him. Then Abashi said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, please let me strike him at once with the spear right to the earth, and I will not have to strike him a second time. See, those are the kind of people you want to hang with. But you also got to learn to keep them restrained at the same time. Sometimes that's the way I feel with Martine. <laughs> He's not here to hear that, but I got to restrain him because he wants to take people out sometimes. They come against people. He's ready to be a big brother. But David said to Bashi, do, do, do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Guiltless. David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall go out to battle and perish. So he knows that God's going to judge Saul. God's going to judge this president, that president, that governor, this governor, that legislator, that senator, that congressman, God's going to take care of those people that need to be taken care of. God will do it. You don't want to be God's judgment. You don't want to be the hand that God uses to judge somebody. You want to be the hand that God uses to heal somebody. That's who you want to be. You don't, listen, you don't want to be the executioner for the Lord. I'm telling you, you don't. 
the Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. We have to learn to respect. Jeremiah 25, talking about Nebuchadnezzar, a very ungodly king. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and a perpetual desolation. God is saying, God is saying that he will take care of business for us. He will judge us. He will bring us the leaders that may need to lead us to judge us if that's what we need is to be judged. Or they need to be judged. Or that leader needs to be judged. John 19. Even Jesus said this. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. See, even Jesus recognized Pontius Pilate's authority over him, and Pontius Pilate eventually said, go ahead and crucify him. Gave him that authority to do the very thing that's going to judge him one day. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel is a politician in, in the kingdom now. He is part of the governorship. He is part of the leadership in, in Babylon. But there are people that are jealous of Daniel. And so some of these guys that are jealous of Daniel, they come up with a new policy. And we'll read what they say, but, but notice the, de- the, the deception, the sneakiness, the wickedness in these politicians that are around Daniel. We still got them today. I'm not saying that the guys around us are doing a good job one way or another. What I'm telling you is I can't be worried about it. And what I'm telling you, don't worry about it. Just pray about it. You can use your voice as long as you don't cross lines and forget you are a believer in Jesus Christ. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them, so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because he he was a godly man. Because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charges against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. This is when the world is going to turn on us. When they begin to use our worship and our belief in our God and make laws to kind of squeeze us and put us in a position to now become outlaws. The day's coming. It will eventually get here. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to the king, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom and administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. So what he's saying is no, he, nobody could pray to any god for 30 days. Unless they were praying to the king. The king heard that and he goes, man, that sounds, I like that one. I'm the only one that's going to get to be prayed to. I like that. Not thinking where this was about to go. But you can see right now because Daniel was faithful in his prayers. Every day he prayed the same way. And because he became a praying man, he is going to go to the executioner. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. He didn't know Daniel was his friend. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home, and in his upper room, with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day, 
and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since the early days. So now he's breaking the law. See, we can break the ordinance of men if it's part of our true worship. Part of our true worship. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God, and they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the lion's den? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till going down to the sun to deliver him. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the command. They brought Daniel and cast him into the lion's den. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. We also know that the king set up later that everybody must bow down to the statue. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down. Thrown into the fiery furnace. So we know, we know that some rules and some laws of the kingdom can be broken but only if they're spiritual in nature. Not just your rights being violated, but the truth of God's word. Let me finish with this. Let brother, let, let, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. This is our decree. This is what we're called to as believers. Nothing wrong with standing up for what you believe. Nothing wrong with calling out people doing things that are wrong and not right. Politicians are what? But what he's saying is we still have to show honor to the position, to the authority, and to the rulers above us somehow, some way. Some of you got to push through that because your day will come and you will get the person you want up there and I'll say that to the rest of them who feel the opposite. Bless those who persecute you. Listen, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. And that's God's vengeance for you. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Is God not good? Listen, this life is preparation for the real life. This life is preparing us to meet our King, our Savior, we don't want to go with an American ideology mentality when we go to heaven. We want to go as children, sons, a wife of the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's who we're going to be in heaven. We're not going to be manual labor workers. We're not going to be politicians. We're not, all this that we're seeing around us right now, we don't carry that into heaven. But we have to be filtered through all that to get to heaven. God's trying to filter us through it. And filter, filter all that worldly stuff out of us. Because look, death is coming. Whether it's this, 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 or this. It's coming. It says it's better to go to the house of mourning than a house of mirth or partying or having a good time. Because that is the end of all men. And, and the living should take it to heart. 
Remember, we're not going to live in America forever. We're going to hand it over. We're going to leave it behind. He's going to come back and get us. Don't be so tangled up with the world that you can't have a, a good, peaceful relationship and walk with the Lord in this life. Don't lose it. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, even if it's in your government. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word that is right in our face sometimes. Lord, we know that we live in crazy times. America is not the same America, Lord. But it was never going to stay one way. It was always changing, always evolving, always moving in a direction. Lord, you said that the devil is the God of this world. And the whole world is under the influence and the sway of the wicked one. And we can see the fingerprints and evidence of the devil in this life. We can see, Lord God, how the enemy is coming against your church, your people. Using legislation, laws, certain politicians, Lord God, to put the squeeze on us as believers. To try to put fear in our hearts, fear in our minds. So that we would fear this world. Father, we pray for peace of mind and peace in our hearts to know that no matter who's our president, which political party takes control of America, we trust you, Lord. Help us find our ability to trust you, Lord. Help us bring unity and not division, Lord. Regardless of what the politicians are saying around us, Lord God, may your church stand strong with love and open arms, embracing every sinner that comes through the doors. And Lord, I thank you that you love us and that you have a plan for us. And, and help us, Lord, maneuver through these troubled times ahead. Give us your wisdom. Put a hunger in our in our hearts for your word and your presence, Lord, as we move forward. And Father, we pray for your will over this country. We pray for your will to be done as it is in heaven in this country, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Have a good Sunday.